We wanted to get our ships unloaded in a hurry. We did not care to keep those precious bottoms occupied too long. Especially was this true when our men found that the crews of the ships wanted a delay in Fiji, where there were apparently plenty of entertainment facilities. This gave our boys a chance to crack back at the Navy. They had rushed the hell out of us when they were in dangerous waters, throwing our stuff into the Higgins boats in any old confused manner so they could pull away at once. And now they wanted us to deliberately slow down so they could spend a few easy days. We unloaded the damn ships as fast as we could, sweating mightily in the effort. We didn't have much gear with us anyway. We piled our rather negligible baggage in a rail yard near the dock close by the refinery. The railroad was a narrow gauge type with toy-sized locomotives and cars, primarily constructed for hauling the lightweight but bulky cut sugarcane. After we had set up a guard at the rail yard dump, Colonel Ferry and a few officers went forward to look over our new area and to take over the property which the 148th Infantry Regiment was not moving out with them. We were to relieve the 148th as part of the island garrison, guarding a sector of Vita Levu. The 148th had been garrisoning the broad, beautiful Sambeto Valley, which lay between Nandi and Latoka, with their headquarters centrally located. During their long stay on Fiji, they had gathered a good bit of information which we would need to secure. This information would save us much bother in scouting out the beaches and likely routes of approach an invading enemy might use. At this stage, it was still feasible for the Japanese to attempt to take Fiji. Like ourselves on New Caledonia, the 148th Infantry, 37th Division, had long been in a position of static defense. They were looking forward to their trip north with the same impatience which we had felt a few months before, and most of them had an accurate impression of where they were headed. New Georgia. We found our new home to be a lovely one, getting a first good look at it as we jeeped up the coastal road toward Nandi where the 2nd Battalion would be stationed. It was the same old story again. A beautiful tropical island, much more settled and civilized than New Caledonia, with some differences in vegetation, but still the same sort of a tropical isle. The main crop on Fiji was sugarcane, and we could see it everywhere along the coast, huge fields of it growing tall and thick of stalk. Temporary layings of narrow-gauge railway were put down during the harvest season, and the stalks were cut and heaped high upon the little rail wagons, which would then be coupled into trains and towed to the refinery by toy engines. We were driving on a road which paralleled this little railroad and even shared bridges with it, the rails and road converging at each bridge approach. This was an economy measure which was perhaps practical in Fiji, but it would have caused trouble in the States. Just picture driving over a bridge on railway tracks each time you had to cross a river, stream, or ditch while driving in the United States. The scenery was beautiful along the way. We had the mountains on our left rising out of the cane fields and foothills near the road and off to our right was the coastal area, more fields, mudflats, and mangroves. Soon we passed the Nandi Airport, a huge air staging area not unlike Tontuda or Plains de Guyax on New Caledonia. Aircraft of all sorts took off and landed in the moments we spent in view of the place. Once again, it was apparent that we were to be stuck close to a noisy field where our sleep would always be interrupted by roaring motors. A short distance beyond the airport, we ran into Nandi itself, a small main street of a town with Indian-run shops and stores. A little beyond, we found the headquarters of the battalion we were to relieve. We noted with our first pleased glance at the new campsite that we were to have floored tents, well-founded on crushed rock, with waterproof paths and very fine-looking prefabricated huts for mess halls. Captain Peterson, Art Handel and I got in contact with the heavy weapons officers and began to learn about H Company's billeting area. Tents were plentiful, no need to crowd men in and each officer could have a 9 by 9 of his own with the fly rigged out front to give him a bit of veranda, and a nice solid frame and floorboards. The 148th had been in place there long enough to make itself quite comfortable. We moved in during the next day and spent but little time getting settled. There was a PX in Nandi, run by a lieutenant from Louisiana with the unforgettable name of Antoine F. Hotar. So we were able to buy khaki uniforms, watches, fountain pens, and other badly needed items. A ration of liquor followed closely after our arrival, and an officer's bar was set up at battalion headquarters. Speaking of bars, my old friends back at Anti-Tank Company, now commanded by Frank Halsey, had fallen into a very nice deal in taking over the site of an old officer's candidate school for company billets. 
Everyone in the whole damned outfit lived in a house of some kind. These buddies of mine also seemed to have more liquor on hand than did the entire remainder of the regiment. We had many good times there at Frank's headquarters. Captain Brickies had taken over the regimental intelligence officer's job, S2, portending a well-deserved promotion in line with new tables of organization which had elevated the S2 to the authorized rank of major. The whole regiment was being reorganized to conform with these new tables, allowing more generous staffs for battalions, and I soon found myself relieved of duties with H Company and placed on the battalion staff as intelligence and scout officer. Later, when we got around to training, this change was to give me a lot of headaches, inasmuch as I had to conduct an intelligence school for scouts and observers. From that point forward, Fiji became another colorful chapter in our service overseas. It was a place that later became monotonous with the grind of training, with various inspectors paying close attention to administrative minuti, with laborious organization of defense positions, with long maneuver periods in the hills, and with days that finally dragged beyond imagination. Training, which we badly needed, continued. The only trouble was that a certain brigadier general was identified with so many of the exercises and demonstrations. We began to despise the training program because of this unpleasant association. Our stay on Fiji was bearable, not because of, but in spite of, the demoralizing influence of this officer, who, whether those in high authority were ever aware of it or not, did much to disgust the men of the division with the otherwise pleasant surroundings on that island. The next few months went by, bringing an occasion upon which date this story can properly end. It was in September, 1943, that a large group of men and officers left the American Division and the Fiji Islands with Major General Hodge, the division commander shaking each one by the hand as he boarded the transport. We were headed initially for New Caledonia, on the first leg of a journey which would see us all through a long trip down under Australia and on to India and incredible adventures in Burma later on. A Brigadier Wingate had conducted successful operations behind the enemy lines in Burma in 1943, employing a new type of infantry organization which he called a Long Range Penetration Group. After his return, he had accompanied the British Prime Minister to the Quebec Conference where it was decided on the highest Allied level that there should also be an American long-range penetration group to fight in Asia. This group would be made up of some 3,300 volunteers, a third of that number to be men with jungle combat experience in World War II. The first inkling of this had come to us in the form of a wire asking for volunteers for a hazardous mission in another theater and adding that the unit would be trained in receiving supplies from the air and living off the land. Petito, Farley, Zimmerman, Brown, Hogan, Coburn, and I were the officers that were among the American Division volunteers, all of us jumping at the opportunity to find more adventure, to see new lands, and to leave the monotonous life we had been leading on Fiji. The ship got underway in the hills of Fiji, forest and grass covered, faded in the distance. Again we were leaning on a ship's rail wondering what the future would hold. My rifles were with me. This time I had a spare fitted with a scope and I still had a few rounds of my selected ammunition. We were all refitted with clothing, and I had made up another pack and kit so I felt ready for anything. We had supposed that we might be trained for coast-watching purposes, and sneaked into Japanese-occupied areas for intelligence or guerrilla work. Actually, we were headed for India, where we would train for a while before talking into Burma as a part of the original 5307 composite unit. The outfit, which was to become famous, as one of the fightingest, hardest marching units in the world, under the name of Merrill's Marauders. Because there were many outstanding faults in the employment of Japanese rifles and riflemen against us, and it was therefore unlikely that we could learn much from them, most of us were not inclined to make any great study of Japanese rifle technique and methods. We all, however, made a few objective studies in order to devise protective measures and successful counter tactics and in so doing, many of us learned things we did not know before. We had no Japanese training manuals available and had to go entirely by what we observed or had described to us. On several occasions, we were able to interview prisoners taken. By far, the greatest source of information as far as the writer was concerned was gained from personal observation. The Japanese use of rifles was different from our own, first of all, in the matter of accuracy. The sights on their weapons and the weapons themselves were not as accurate as our own, 
and their standards of marksmanship were not on a par with ours. Most of their rifles had a base setting of 400 meters, which would allow only rough holding at the shorter ranges. The absence of peep sights and drift compensating devices precluded them from any fine shooting at longer ranges. In spite of all this, though, it would not be fair to say that the Japanese could not shoot. They killed too many of us to permit that assertion. Their field marksmanship methods were practical. As far as I made out, they did their firing from the principal body positions. Prone, squatting, and standing. And like us, they naturally preferred the prone position with its advantages of greater steadiness, protection from enemy fire, and concealment. When in defense, of course, they always dug in and fired their rifles by resting the forearms on heaped up and camouflaged spoil dirt from which the trench was made, or other materials placed there for the purpose. The Japanese were skilled at using natural forearm rests in the field and, given a choice, they would always take position behind a log or stump which would provide such a rest. Then they would slide the long barrel of their rifle out and fire with both hands held in almost the same place on the weapon, left hand back against the trigger guard with the weight of the rifle lying upon the log or stump top or heap of dirt, and supported at any point along the length of the forearm. On a few occasions I have seen evidence of the Japanese using a short forked stick which they would cut and carry with them to provide a firing rest for the forearm of the stocks on their long arisakas. This enthusiasm for the use of forearm rest to increase the steadiness of holding for prone or dug-in riflemen was emphasized by the inclusion of a light steel wire bipod on the 7.2M99 rifle, the official Japanese rifle during the latter years of the war. This wire bipod, really a monopod, because the ends of the two legs were only an inch or so apart, should not be laughed at. It could do a lot to help steady a nervous infantryman's hold in battle, and it weighed no more than the extra length of sling strap which we carry around for the sake of steadier holding, but which we never use in battle. It seems pretty evident that the preferred system of firing, as far as the Japanese were concerned, was from the prone position with rest, and it is certain that every Japanese soldier was properly discouraged from firing from the less steady positions except where necessary. Even Japanese tree snipers, from indications given by a very few examples, were inclined to improvise a rest for their rifle if they could. We can take a lesson from this. While it may seem ridiculous for the rifleman who will have to shoot his target at less than 50 yards to utilize a forearm or muzzle rest, any combat veteran knows well that such a measure is not silly. When you are going about the business of killing a man, you want to be sure of every little detail. With a good rest to aim from, a man can have an awfully bad case of buck fever and still do relatively good shooting. That the Japanese realized as much and apparently taught their riflemen accordingly is entirely to their credit. I have seen all sorts of artificial and natural rifle rests which were designed and used by Japanese infantrymen, many of them displaying great individual ingenuity. Everything from heaped-up coconut logs or husks to little slabs of spike-based armor plate, about nine or ten inches high by a foot in width, with U-shaped notches in the top for the rifle forend. Our Pacific enemy used a rifle rest whenever possible. Often it was not possible, though, the Japanese met that situation in their own way. They used their version of the prone position, without rest or sling, a tough proposition for short-limbed people. This would be very awkward indeed to an American, less flexible of muscle and tendon than his little brown brother. It does have the advantage of being somewhat higher than the conventional squatting position, which gives knee rest for the right as well as the left elbow. The strange thing about it all is that this squatting position was never formally taught in the German-guided school of Japanese marksmanship. Troops picked it up in the field, apparently. I have seen it used several times, and I think it is a more or less natural adaptation of the Japanese civilian squat. Peasants squat down to talk to each other in rural Japan, and use the position as a standard attitude of rest. This and kneeling served to replace sitting entirely, at least as far as I have been able to learn. Little use was made by the Japanese of the sitting position which we know. This might have been because the sitting takes a little more time to assume and arise from than the kneeling or squatting. Our own prone position, which calls for the left arm being well out forward and the hand just behind the upper sling swivel, works pretty well in the field. But I am inclined to believe that it has been somewhat influenced by our almost universal use of the gunsling during range practice. 
When a sling is no longer used, and it is seldom used in combat, there comes an immediate tendency for the rifleman to move his left hand farther to the rear, bringing his lower arm into a position a little nearer vertical. For men who habitually fire without the sling, this tendency is even stronger, and many of the better shots will so shoot with the left lower arm held almost straight up and down, and with the left hand grasping, yes, grasping, you have to do that without a sling, the stock at the magazine. This measure has the effect of removing another set of muscles from the task of supporting the weapon so that its weight in front will rest directly upon the grounded left elbow instead of being held up by the quivering tension of the biceps. For that reason and also for others, the Japanese have adopted this far back forearm grip as standard for prone shooting. I found that out by handing an unloaded rifle to several of the first Japanese prisoners we took and making them assume the various positions. All of them use the prone position I have described, with the hand far back and the body line around behind the rifle, rather than at 45-0 from the line of sight. The adoption of this position by the Japanese was undoubtedly influenced by the shortness of reach of the average Japanese soldier, which was so short in most cases that it could not be compensated for by merely shortening the buttstock. Also, the distance from shoulder to cheek is very short on Japanese bodies, which further increases the need for short butt stocks. But the high, far-back hand-grip prone position which the Japanese used was adopted principally because it made for better shooting. The rifle stocks could have been shortened enough more to permit a lower position with extended left hand if they had thought it advisable. The prisoners I was interviewing then went ahead and demonstrated the squatting position for me. I was conducting my interview in our camp at Cape Esperance at the little stockade we had improvised by tying ropes from one coconut tree to another. I had undertaken the task with due precautions, selecting several of the less sullen prisoners to do the demonstrating with boltless rifles, their own long Arisaka 38. Two guards with loaded Tommy guns were on hand to prevent any monkey shines while I spoke to the Japanese by means of sign language and one of their captured phrase books. We had none of our own at that time. I would take the rifle from them from time to time to illustrate the position I wanted them to take. When I demonstrated the sitting position, the particular Japanese who was next given the rifle immediately assumed the squatting position. I was to discover that the Japanese seldom use the sitting position. I was greatly impressed with the apparent ease and speed with which all of the Japanese could assume the squatting position and return to their feet. They could all get down and up in nothing flat. Though three of the four men I was examining were in bad physical shape, the explanation is of course simple, though it caused me some puzzlement at the time. They squat on their upper heels, buttocks resting against the Achilles tendon region of their rear ankles, with feet flat on the ground, in their homes, in the streets, and everywhere else. Most of the toilets in the Orient are made with two places for the feet to be positioned on both sides of a trough about six inches wide. This goes for their modern water closets too not just privies in the back country. The squat is the natural eastern position of rest, and from what I have seen, it has played hell with the furniture business in the Orient. In most Japanese homes, there aren't any chairs, and the same can be said of the more primitive places in India and Burma. Being more comfortable flat on their feet, their balance is better than our own in that position. And they can lean forward from the ankles to counterbalance the recoil, which all but the more freakishly flexible Americans cannot. The squat corresponds to our sitting position with them in that it comes next to prone in steadiness, and it has a great advantage over our sitting position because it can be assumed and recovered from in half the time. For some types of fighting, I believe it would be the most practical of all combat firing positions. In a moving fight in high grass or sparse bush, it would be the answer. All of this goes without its other advantage of keeping the rifleman's posterior, so subject to rheumatism from sleeping on the cold ground, from an occasional dampening in cold mud, wet grass, or swamp ooze. From the standpoint of positions, the Japanese has a slight edge upon us in his greater flexibility of body. We would be better off if we could squat with equal ease. The sitting position used by my prisoner demonstrators was awkward, and one of them grinned sheepishly as he fumbled around with it. All of them would have assumed the squat instead, by choice. They could all fire from the standard army kneeling position, though one of them indicated that he could stretch his squatting position upward to attain the same high line of sight he got by kneeling. Naturally, if he could do that, there would be small point in his using the kneeling position at all. 
The only advantage it possesses over squatting for fire at ground targets is the higher line of sight it provides for the purpose of clearing cover intervening between firer and target. It is much less steady, and it is no easier than squatting for the Japanese to assume. That one prisoner was a bright Japanese boy. When I got these Japanese up into the standing position, they began to reveal a lot of faults. Either they had had no training in shooting from their hind legs, or else they had paid no attention to the instructors when it had been given. It was a cinch that they had done little firing from it. They were awkward, with every tendency to misplace the left elbow, to lean forward, to spread the legs entirely too far, in short, to make every possible mistake. Two of the Japanese had become quite interested, and they were being very cooperative by this time. Perhaps, for all I know, they themselves were the nearest thing to rifle shooting enthusiasts that there could be in a country where few individuals could own firearms. I was just about to get a bolt for the rifle and try to get an idea across to them that I would like to see them manipulate the bolt as in rapid fire. I figured that by removing the follower in spring I could have one of them operate it, and perhaps confirm my suspicions that Japanese always removed the rifle from the shoulder before manipulating the bolt. I was also interested in trying out that test on a Japanese we had who was a southpaw, to see what advantages the straight Arisaka bolt would hold for the left-handed shooter. I had gotten quite an audience by this time. Quite a few men were assembled around outside the stockade to watch the proceedings. They were all entertained considerably by the antics of their late enemies, and I felt inwardly that it was all to the good. A close look at these Japanese prisoners would convince the men, once and for all, of their own superiority. I wanted to get along with my inquiries, but I was interrupted. A jeep came putting up the beach trail from the north with a visiting fireman in it, some major from Corps headquarters. He stared in wide-eyed disbelief at the scene of an American lieutenant who was apparently conducting a class of Japanese prisoners in the subject of rifle marksmanship. I hastened to report to him and explain, dismissing the class as I did so. We didn't have many visitors at that time, but I knew how to treat them, knew what they wanted. Show them around the old Japanese bivouac areas. Let them see all of the bodies and skeletons, tell them a few stories, give them a saber and a pistol. Then they'll go away happy and likely write you up favorably if their visit happened to be of the usual staff snooping variety. These staff officers were a pain. But then I had just about finished with the prisoners anyway, and didn't mind the interruption so much. Besides, it was almost time to have evening mess. At my invitation, the Major accompanied me over toward the mess area, where the usual canned foods had been heated. Only for this one meal we had got several bunches of ripe bananas over from Savo by dugout canoe, and hence were going to have an unusually tasty dessert. It was getting on toward dusk. It was getting on toward dusk. The sun was going down over Savo way across the channel, and the heat of the day had partly gone from the shade of the grove. While some of the men wrestled with the Major's bedroll, the two of us walked along the grassy trail, each of us in one of the ruts which had been worn by Japanese trucks traveling there only a few days earlier. Japanese rifles used in World War II were all copied from the basic Mauser pattern, and as in the case of other nations' modifications of Paul Mauser's good rifle, most of the changes proved to be steps backward. They retained to the last the straight bolt of the old 98 Mauser, made quite a few minor changes in the ignition assembly, adopted a different floor plate latch, and extended the tang portions of both receiver and guard to facilitate the use of a laminated buttstock. It would have been a more practical procedure to have simply tooled up for the Model 98, as was. The Japanese simply joined what might well be called an international association of fumblers who, faced with a near-perfect model to work from which they were absolutely unable to improve, went ahead nevertheless and worked a few of their own ideas, producing their so-called version of the good old German man and game killer. And like our own ordnance department, they produced a bastard rifle. For one thing, they made their rifles entirely too long. The standard model 38 6.5, for instance, had a ridiculous 31 and a quarter inches of barrel screwed into it, which gave the weapon an overall length of 50 and a quarter inches. The only worthwhile purpose served by making the barrels that long was a great reduction of muzzle blast and flash, which furnished the American uninformed including one high-ranking general, with reasons for stating erroneously that the Japanese had developed an absolutely smokeless powder, much better for jungle fighting than any of ours. 
There were, of course, numerous disadvantages to the longer rifles. They were unwieldy and awkward, especially in the jungle. They were too heavy for their caliber. And this excess of weight and length, unlike certain other features built into Japanese rifles, was certainly not demanded by any of the peculiarities of the Japanese soldier. The Japanese doughboy was an awfully little man, on the average, for such a big gun. Another fixed idiocy of the Japanese was manifest in the adoption of the receiver cover for all rifles. Its utilization necessitated the cutting of two deep grooves for almost the full length of the receiver, which certainly did nothing to strengthen the action. The protection which that foolish contrivance could give to the working parts of the rifle was negligible, and if it was kept on during temperature changes, such as those incurred in transferring the weapon from the shade into the sunlight, it worked to facilitate the condensation of moisture and the resultant formation of big gobs of rust on the bolt surface and ignition parts. Whenever the action was operated with the receiver cover on the weapon rattled like all of the proverbial tin pots and pans in hell. I know of at least two Japanese who were located by our people because of that rattling sound as they operated their bolts and who were killed before they fired a second shot. The Japanese instigated alterations of the ignition mechanism tended to increase the weight of the moving parts over those of the Mauser. A hollow firing pin and upper sear engagement such as the Japanese developed must have been rather difficult to manufacture. Even if it did eliminate the need of the Mauser-type locking arrangement of upper sear engagement and firing rod, it is nice to aim this criticism from an entrenched position. Standing in my own shoes, I can criticize the Japanese for the changes they wrought in the Mauser firing pin mechanism, but if I happen to be one of the experts who developed the action of our own M1903 modification of the Mauser, I would keep awfully quiet about the whole thing. Because compared to the ill-conceived ignition system of our own bolt action, which was designed with no regard whatsoever for the basic principle of firearms design which demands a firm, crisp blow on the primer, the Japanese modification is a dream of perfection. When our own experts chopped the sturdy one-piece Mauser firing pin in two, and then coupled the two poor dismembered parts together for operation with an inherently ill-functioning joint, they succeeded in accomplishing at one stroke of the drawing pin a point of extreme unreliability for the Springfield rifle, and they also made certain that there was at least one part of their rifle that would break with great regularity, causing the target shot to have to fire many alibi runs on the rifle range, and making the soldier do God knows what on the battlefield. The United States and the Japanese alike, in my opinion, would have done well to have adopted the Mauser ignition system as it was. The Japanese extended their dirty work farther back on the bolt, and produced a safety and lock that, though mechanically sound, was vastly inferior to the one on the Mauser, being equally difficult to manipulate with cold fingers and generally more noisy in operation. Its flaring rear, mushrooming outward on the end of the bolt, did provide some protection from the escaping gases which naturally accompanied the use of poorly loaded Japanese ammunition, and its secureness against allowing bolt parts to be blown rearward into the firer's face was likely greater than the Springfield. The Japanese, like many of our experts, were still living in the Dark Ages when it came to weapons sense, and were similarly overly bayonet conscious, going to great lengths to make their rifles into good bayonet handles. They built massive upper bands and hooked good strong studs onto them, and kept the front sights and the muzzle ends well adapted to the fitting of these long, obsolete toad stabbers, and they accordingly increased the weight of all of their rifles. The folding bayonet on their Model 1911 cavalry carbine with its massive hinge and latch provided the high mark of this foolish and barbaric influence in modern weapons design. In case the foregoing paragraph has not made my stand in this matter clear, let me give you my own opinion on the bayonet and hand-to-hand -hand combat in general. It is my belief that the bayonet is about as useless a bit of equipment in this present day and age as the cavalry saber. We should have dispensed years ago with both the weapon itself and the hours of wasted effort which went into bayonet instruction. The present-day apologists for the retention of that obsolete item will argue for the first few minutes of a discussion and claim an actual combat value for the weapon. Then, when loudly called down and corrected by all of the men in the room who happen to be wearing combat infantry badges, they will lapse into a lot of drivel about stimulating morale and improving the physical condition of the soldier. Such arguments are as stupid as they are dangerous, 
there are plenty of the useful phases of training which will serve to teach a useful subject to a man and harden him physically at the same time. And if you want to give a man calisthenics, well, give him calisthenics. Don't try to sell an intelligent American on the idea of killing his enemy the way Sir Galahad did. Let the foreign nations retain their ideas about bayonet fighting. After our experience in this war, we can rely on our own judgment, at least in the evaluation of foreign methods. For all practical purposes, there hasn't been any bayonet fighting in this war of ours. And it is time we admitted our past foolishness in hanging on to the bayonet all of these years. It will be even more foolish for us to continue to weigh down the front end of our weapons with a lot of extraneous wood and metal in front of the lower band. We are not now making that mistake, for the bayonet has been cut to knife length, and is mainly being used as a knife. It was to our advantage that the Japanese wasted much more time and effort than we did with pig stickers. It is to the great discredit of our intelligence that we waited so long to change our bayonet into a sheath knife that would be put on the end of a rifle for morale and other purposes. In addition to the features of the weapons which were more or less arbitrarily decided upon by Japanese ordnance authorities, there were a number of points which were more or less demanded by the fact that the Japanese soldiers were on the whole mechanically stupid. Japanese weapons design had to be influenced by the faults of the Japanese soldier. I refer in particular to the barleycorn front sight and the open V rear, which are the simplest, the most rugged, and the most practical sight. After a great amount of personal experience gained in instructing the Chinese, that fact has at last become obvious to me. The great problem faced by the Japanese marksmanship instructors was more mechanical than visual. They had to get across the idea of trigger squeeze so that the canny Japanese would not tend to buck his shot two paddy fields to the right of his target. Those people weren't worried about making their man able to put all of his shots into a 10-inch bull at 200 yards. They were worried about enabling him to stand some chance of hitting a man standing up at a hundred. We could have done well at some of our IRTCs to have reoriented our own training program in that same direction. The Barleycorn site, age-old, familiar, simple as hell, made just as good a site as any for the mine-run Japanese doughboy. Anyone who has faced the abysmal ignorance of the common Oriental soldiers, as I have, will readily back me up in this. The Japanese were more or less forced to use open sights because there were no good military peep sights for them to copy at the time they designed their rifles. The first peep sight, which was optically worth a damn, was put on the Enfield and the Browning auto rifles in 1917, and it was a mechanical abortion of the first water. The first practical aperture rear sight, which has gotten into popular military use, can presently be seen on our own MI. Before its advent, there just wasn't a good all-around peep sight. So, with the exception of a few peep-type drift slides seen on an occasional Arisaka, the Japanese stuck to the V-notch. Now, before all of the snipers of World War I jump up and cry for my blood because of my inference that the O-03 Springfield site is no damned good, let me do a little explaining. It took a highly skilled marksman to use the too far forward and entirely too small aperture that was on the O-03. The common soldier didn't fool with it in combat, any more than he did with the sling and there weren't enough good shots in either one of our recent wars to cut any ice at all. If, at the outset of this war, we had not had available the excellent M1 rear sight and the properly positioned aperture rear sights, which were built into some of the wartime versions of the O3, I, for my part, would have preferred to see barleycorn-type sights in use on our rifles in preference to the old O3 sight. Not for my own personal use, mind you, but for the use of the great mass of men who had to be taught to use their weapons in precious few hours' time, with a definite limit set upon the amount of marksmanship training of all sorts to be given them. The Japanese at least recognized one or two of their limitations. If our Garand had been out in time for them to copy it by 1900 or thereabouts, it might have been a different story. Not the war, for it would have taken more than a good rear sight to have changed that. But the Japanese that missed my ear a few inches at Morovovo might have hit me in the bean, and that, I think, would have made a big difference, to George at least. The great mass of rifles which I have so far seen in the hands of Japanese has been almost entirely made up of the types commonly referred to as the Arasaka rifles. These are all of the various models officially adopted, which are normally issued to the Japanese infantry. The great variety of rifles that were seen on every Japanese front was present because of the Japanese' great hesitancy to discard anything he had captured, 
regardless of its uselessness or the unavailability of ammunition. Then, too, the Japanese frequently captured certain models of rifles and machine guns in such quantities that they thought it wise to load ammunition in their own factories to fit the captured weapons. So we found large numbers of British Enfields, Dutch Styres, American M1917 Enfields, Mousers and Crags in the possession of the Japanese on Guadalcanal, with ample evidence that their use was not the idea of individuals, but rather the carrying out of a directive from higher authority. The M1917 Enfields I saw had been modified a bit to take the Japanese bayonet, and quantities of Japanese loaded ammunition were on hand in 303 British caliber for use in the captured British weapons. There were, of course, far more Japanese than captured weapon around, the long-barreled Arisaka 25 being seen most often. The Japanese Model 38 6.5 Militur rifle, which is the official name for the standard length, 25 Arisaka is not a bad gun, in spite of the things you have read elsewhere and the derogatory remarks I have just finished making about it. With the exception of the innovation of a hollow firing pin with an inside mainspring, a combination bolt head and safety lock, and the addition of a third lug, the bolt itself is rigidly held to Mauser pattern. This additional duo functional lug on the forward part of the bolt, which follows the left lug race, is slightly to the rear of the left lug proper and acts as a bolt stop, thereby saving the important rear surface of the lug itself from being battered during manipulation by the bolt stop. This feature, combined with a rearward lengthening of the receiver, acts to prevent the cramping of the bolt in rearmost position. This benefit is secured through firm support of the bolt in its rearmost position, where it retains more than two full inches of its length within the receiver barrel. This is an improvement over the mouser, but it is gained at some cost for it tends to increase the overall length of the receiver for a particular cartridge. The extractor is of conventional Mauser design, attached to the bolt by means of the usual collar and riding in the right lug race. The bolt handle is projected straight outward from the bolt in a direction at right angles to the axis of the locking lugs and is positioned three quarters to the rear on the length of the bolt. It is some two and a quarter inches in length and its knob is elliptical in cross section and its base is square, forming a substantial safety lug. The rifle I have present at hand has a single, large gas port cut through the left side, closed position, of the bolt, just forward of the extractor collar. But there were varied types of gas ports in other Arasaka bolts which I have seen. The Arasaka bolt can be disassembled faster than any others of the Mauser type. A rank amateur can jerk it into its five basic units in four seconds and keep a hand free to toy with his gal's ear all the while if she happens to be close by. There's nothing wrong with this bolt except the rather glaring fault of a straight bolt handle. Except for that major shortcoming, it would seem to me that the Japanese actually committed less non-constructive butchery on the Mauser than did the designers of the O3 rifle. The guts of the bolt are certainly more foolproof than the unnecessarily complex O3 arrangement of striker, collar, firing pin rod, and spring and I don't think there would have been as much field breakage with the Arisaka if the Japanese had used metals equal to ours in their weapons. The receiver itself follows the old Mauser design with the most apparent alteration being an extension of the tang strip to the rear for an inch or so. This is mainly for the purpose of facilitating the joining of the two pieces of wood which make up the buttstock of the Arisaka and to provide bedding necessary with the usage of such soft gunstock woods. I doubt if there are any other reasons of importance. The guard, of course, is similarly extended on the underside of the grip and the two are joined at the rear by an extra guard screw set into the rear of the receiver tang through both pieces of steel so that the wood joint is gripped tightly between the guard rear and the receiver tang. The bottom cut for the sear is positioned much farther forward in the receiver than on the Mauser and the engagement is forward within the rear receiver ring. This position is necessary because of the deeply forward cut stroke space in the rear of the bolt, which allows the use of a relatively short firing pin with its full length retained at cock or relaxed within the actual body of the bolt proper. The action does not have a bolt sleeve, its functions being taken over by the rear of the bolt and the safety lock assembly. The bolt stop and ejector assembly is a clever gadget. It is similar to the Mauser in appearance, but a little different in function. 
The bolt stop acts as does the stop of the Mauser, though it butts against the third lug on the bolt instead of the usual left locking lug. The cleverness of the assembly shows up when we examine the ejector. It is of the pivoting type, similar in principle but not in appearance to the Springfield and much stronger and more certain. It does not depend upon the continuously maintained pressure of an ejector spring as does the Mauser, nor upon the short radius and critically timed pivoting action which is used in the Springfield. The Arasaka has instead a long radius pivoting type ejector, which is actuated by the third lug, bolt stop lug, as the bolt approaches its rearmost position during the backstroke. There can be no failure due to a clogged or tired spring, which frequently causes trouble in the Mauser, and it is not unduly delicate of construction or critical of fit, as is the ejector of your good old Springfield. The size of the ejector and bolt stop assembly was increased over the copied Mauser in order to gain the advantage described above and, it would seem, the advantage was sufficient to warrant the additional weight and bulk. The trigger mechanism is roughly similar to that of the Mauser, producing the orthodox military-type trigger pull, with a preliminary take-up before the full resistance of the engaged sear is felt by the trigger. The trigger looks to be positioned in a much more forward position than the Mauser, an appearance created by the increased length of the Arasaka receiver and the forward position of the Arasaka sear. The receiver ring is not enlarged to exceed the diameter of the receiver proper, and it has two holes in its top drilled concentrically through the ring. These are presumably gas ports. I have seen a few rifles that did not have any and some which had one such hole. Throughout my description of the receiver, I have been unconsciously avoiding mention of the useless metal cover which I spoke of earlier in the text. Its stupidity of design is too obvious to merit more than a mere speaking of and the two unsightly grooves which are cut lengthwise along the receiver to guide the contraption back and forth and keep it in place as the bolt is operated are even worse. The guy that thought that abortion up did dirt to the Japanese soldier. Most of the Japanese on Guadalcanal were smart enough to throw away this bolt cover and use the rifle with the unblued bolt flashing boldly forth in the sunlight. The barrels are, in wise retention of the Mauser design, fitted and cut for the extractor, in such a way as to give the greatest possible support to the cartridge case. The entire cartridge, head of case and all, enters into the chamber of the rifle, as does the head of the bolt, and the breech closure is the most complete of any modern bolt-action rifle in existence today. The follower is a metal-stamped adaptation of the Mauser, and the follower spring is a wire substitute for the flat strip equivalent in the Mauser and Springfield. The floor plate is essentially the same as the Springfield, as is the entire guard, though the latch is a modified one of simple lever design to replace the hidden Mauser type. Also, the guard is extended rearward to match the metal of the receiver tang above and to furnish a rearward location for a third guard screw, an artifice meant to hold together the two-piece buttstock. There is ample room in the trigger guard for a heavily gloved finger, though it is not as large as the standard military Mausers. The possibility of releasing the floor plate latch with the trigger finger during firing is only theoretical, the latch spring being powerful enough to ensure against such mishap. The profile of the Arasaka's 31.4-inch barrel is not shaped for accuracy, being bottlenecked abruptly from a point about inches in front of the receiver. The barrel from that point forward is rather small in diameter, tapering only slightly outward to the muzzle. The rear sight of the long folding leaf design is mounted on a base fixed to the barrel after the manner of the Springfield, but a little farther forward, with the rear end of its fixed base jutting against a shoulder in the bottleneck of the barrel instead of the receiver itself. The tall, roughly graduated leaf swings upward from the front from a folded down carry position, pivoting on a pin type hinge similar to the one on the 03. It is graduated up to 2,400 meters in increments of 100 meters each, starting with 500, and is scored on the side with a notch for each graduation. The battle leaf is presumably set at 500 and the bottom of the leaf has a notch cut in it to provide a 400 meter setting. These sites are obviously crude and unscientific, but nevertheless highly suitable for the Oriental soldiers to use. The open V-notch, which is the only rear sight profile used, there are three separate Vs cut into the rear sight leaf and slide assembly, is matched up with a barley corn type sharp pointed front sight. The forward position of the rear sight, several inches in front of the Springfields, is less critical of focus, 
and has the desirable effect of sharpening up the definition of the rear sight for older eyes, a feature that becomes more desirable when barley corn and open V sights are used. Adjustments, for elevation only, are made in the rear sight by pressing a latch on the right side of the elevating slide and moving the slide freely to the desired elevation, where the latch, when released, will take hold in the proper notch on the right side of the rear sight leaf. There is no ready provision for lateral adjustment or windage, although the front sight blade can be driven over to obtain a mean zero. An allowance for bullet drift is not provided for in the design of the rear sight, and in view of the myriad inexactitudes inherent in the barley corn type of sights and Japanese marksmanship alike, we can certainly excuse the Japanese ordnance experts for skipping over the relatively unimportant factor of drift allowances. This neglect, however, provides proof that in spite of the 2,400-meter rear sight leaf, there was no intent to build a weapon suitable for ultra-long-range fire at individual targets. The sling swivels are widely separated on the rifle to make it easy for the rifleman to carry the weapon diagonally across his back and yet keep both hands free for climbing or carrying. The sturdy lower band which carries the upper sling swivel is set far out on the forearm of the stock, much too far to permit any use of the sling for shooting purposes, unless the sling might possibly be used in connection with the legs in the continental back position. The lower sling swivel was almost identical with that of the Springfield, but situated much closer to the grip. In some rifles, I saw the lower band was cleverly bedded down upon a steel fixture neatly fitted into the forearm. This prevented bending the long barrel. The handguard was packed against the barrel here with a pad of thin, greased cloth. The stock and handguard, along with the excessively massive butt plate and sling swivels, were obviously constructed with the constant thought of bayonet employment in mind, and they were much stronger than would have ordinarily been necessary for such a light-calibered rifle. However, some of that appearance of undue thickness was brought about by the required usage of third-rate wood of which the stocks were made. The upper band was also heavily built and rather tightly fit about the barrel. The bayonet stud was an integral part of it, cut out of the same piece of metal and placed in the same position as the Springfield or Mauser. A good steel cleaning rod projected outward from a hole in the forend inside the upper band and was held securely in place by a spring-loaded latch and leaded into the forend at six o'clock, just to the rear of the upper band. The slings furnished with the rifle, as seen on Guadalcanal, were mostly of good leather, though a few rubberized canvas ones had begun to come through by that time. Later on in Burma, the Japanese seemed to have run entirely out of leather. The accepted Japanese method of firing this long rifle from the prone position seemed to call for gripping the forearm just in front of the trigger guard and lying at the usual 25-degree angle from the line of fire while aiming. This put the left forearm nearly vertical, which has its advantages, when not using the sling, with a hell of a lot of long barrel quivering out in front. It could not have been an especially steady position. The more deadly Japanese shots, of whom I have encountered a few, were past masters at the improvisation of different forearm rests, which enabled them to fire with greatly increased accuracy. There were not so many dead-eye dicks to be found, thank God. It doesn't take very many to be too many, and much of the respect which I now have for the deadly effectiveness of rifle sniping is based upon later experiences which, though few in number, drove home in my mind a first-hand knowledge of the terror instilling damage to individual and unit morale, which can be meted out by a few accurately aimed rifle shots. The Arisaka rifle I have just described is a pretty good gun. It is clumsier than any of ours, but in slow fire it is easier to shoot. It has practically no recoil, what with its lengthy barrel, its moderately loaded cartridge, and its weight of 10 pounds with sling. It has fair accuracy up to about 500 yards and a muzzle velocity of 2,400 foot-seconds, which puts it up in the high-power military class and gives it a maximum range of some 2,600 yards. It loads and operates in the same manner as any Mauser-type rifle, and although it would not show up as well as the O3, or of course the Garand, on the rifle range, especially in rapid fire, it would not be much slower to operate and reload under combat conditions. All of the other rifles I will describe in following chapters have evolved themselves from, or were forerunners of, this basic rifle of the Japanese army. It was, I believe, the most extensively used Japanese weapon in World War II, and although it was superseded by later models of different caliber, it remained popular with the troops. 
All of the Japanese I have talked to expressed a marked preference for the old, reliable Arasaka 6.5 over any of the later Japanese guns and all of the foreign guns, except for the Garand. In spite of all of its shortcomings, some of which were so stupid that they defied belief, almost as much as certain of our own ordnance inanities concerned with the adoption of our Springfield, it proved to be a good, reliable combat rifle. And it killed many thousand Americans who were armed with the best weapons in the world. 